okay? Right, um, so uh, I'll be very short just as well because um, we're a bit over time. And um, one general comment, and this is a comment that I make so many times with the papers that are sent to my journal, um, is that this whole area of decentralized finance is you know, the future of, of finance. Blockchains are like the motorways, the smart contracts are the cars and the, you know, the crypto, uh, the, the, the gas. Um, and so it's, you know, it's at the forefront of, of academic research and also innovative in so many ways in the practitioner's perspective that, I mean, I teach a couple of modules and I, you know, I do quite a lot in the press. And honestly, one has to do something and then completely revise it because by the time you've finished doing all the empirical work, um, everything's changed. And so as soon as I see a paper that has um, data ending in 2018, I realize that um, it's great. You've, you've got your idea, you, you've, you've got some models going, but whatever happened in 2018 is not necessarily relevant today. And I would definitely want that data to be updated. So I hope that, as you said at the end of your presentation, that you would be um, wanting to revise the paper, the very first thing is to revise it. So just to summarize, you're using some very nice data analysis and uh, I don't doubt your econometric models are all doing very well and the data's clean and everything. And you demonstrate something that is um, intuitive, you know, as the introduction of futures increases the uh, correlations and reduces exchange arbitrage opportunities overall. Um, of course, exchange arbitrage still exists. And when there's a lot of volatility, particularly during events such as May 19th, um, the back, backstop liquidity providers are very happy to, to take on the liquidated positions and because they can exercise a huge amount of exchange arbitrage at those times. But this is going ahead into a different zone. I'll get there a little bit later. So what you find is fine, but it only examines the spawn derivatives markets that currently, I should have put currently, have a very full, small fraction of the trading volumes now. Um, and this data ending 2018, um, I would not accept that at my journal. Other journals might, but uh, I wouldn't. Um, and it seems that there's not really sufficient understanding of what's happening with Tether, um, the introduction of perpetuals, particularly with the price leadership and dominance from starting with the BitMEX perpetual, but then since the problems with BitMEX, um, Binance has more or less taken over on the so-called unregulated exchanges. And these are all things that need to be written about in any paper that looks at the subject that you are. Um, and I do think that you should um, improve your understanding of how professional traders are actually operating. I did mention um, backstop liquidity providers, but there's a whole world of clearing in um, the derivatives markets now that is completely different to the way traditional markets operate. And that particular type of microstructure, along with the fragmentation of the exchanges, is something that has to be addressed. And you mentioned that US traders don't use those exchanges, but if you look at the, um, the issuance of Tether, mainly to um, Cumberland Capital, for example, Alameda Research and many other, you know, 95% of Tether in issuance has gone to market makers, mainly in the US, that are operating on these exchanges through offshore subsidiaries. I'm, an, I'm in direct contact with places like XBTO market makers that just, um, uh, they just operate with an offshore subsidiary in order to, um, that's on the options on Deribit. But, Basically, US um, professional traders are really still driving this market. So I just took this from the Crypto Compare monthly exchange review just to show that, I mean, your data end way before this, a year before this, but uh, you can see how um, the markets you're looking at, obviously CBOE were ousted by the um, CME, but still, even after the introduction of the Bitcoin ETFs on futures, which will be settled according to CME futures, um, uh, their, their, their Bitcoin reference rate, um, you'll see that the, the share of CME is, so this is the spot, uh, Binance, um, Coinbase has obviously some, but still places like OKEX and Huobi, those are large um, peripatetic um, exchanges moving around the Asian region, 
um, and on the um, derivatives, derivatives have now taken over in terms of trading volumes more than 50% of the um, total uh, volume. So this is the monthly volume and you can see that the CME here is a really, really tiny fraction of what's going on right now. So any paper that is actually looking at the introduction of CME futures, I think needs to perhaps re reassess what you can do with, for example, the introduction of the BitMEX perpetuals. Um, and that's a nice one to look at because um, they did dominate the market for a while and they didn't have too many other um, derivative pairs. But the problem with Binance is that um, they trade so many pairs. And so, um, you know, you would have to have a control group where there's no Binance perpetuals. Um, and of course, they do do USD, but they're the inverse products because they're a tether exchange. So the direct type futures. But the good thing is that they're open 24 seven, like the, um, the spot markets. It's always difficult to do an analysis when you've got something like the CME closing at weekends. And finally, just to go to your positioning in the literature, that was the weakest point. It felt to me like you had sort of updated your introduction and literature review to sort of add a few references that were sort of more recent. So you had a smattering of 2020 and 21 references, but why, why do references on blockchain consensus protocols? And I just did a quick search of um, the uh, uh, price efficiency and Bitcoin on Scopus and came up with um, these papers, which I uh, just summarized here. One's in the Journal of Futures Markets, one's in Journal of Empirical Finance. And of course, we've got quite a few mathematicians finding that there's some nice data and, you know, they can get the data, do the analysis. But the difference with us, with finance people, is that we don't just do that. We understand the markets. Not only do we position our work in the current literature, but we explain what's actually happening in financial markets, which people's publishing and mathematical journals won't be able to do. OK. Oh, by the way, one more thing. Um, I just thought I might mention that you you might take a look at um, at the blogs that I write. Um, I won't. You can just Google Carol Alexander blogs because a lot of them are out of this sort of issue, particularly the Tether, Binance, Bitcoin um, axis. Um, and uh, you might uh, find out uh, that, that you can get quite quite a bit of sort of um, use them as a bit, bit of a springboard to those issues that I was just talking about. So it's just Carol Alexander blogs. All right. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, Patrick. Uh...